so excited to have one of my friends, Philip Lemoyne, on today's show. What's good, everyone? If this is the first time we're meeting, my name is Philip Lemoyne, and I'm actually a full time cinematographer, but I love to cook. One of my all time favorite dishes, though, has always been my mom's lumpia. And there it is, guys. The spin on my mother's recipe, the Auntie Arlene, uh, my favorite lumpia. So there's like a million chocolate chip cookie recipes on the internet, and I swear to you, I've tried every single one of them. I think that all chocolate chip cookie recipes are kind of the same, but what makes them big and chewy is the way that you incorporate those ingredients. The secret to making the chocolate chip cookies chewy is that we're gonna melt the butter. So if I could describe the texture of these cookies, I would say that the outside has a nice soft crunch to it, but the inside is a really dense, chewy middle. He's going to talk to us today about his journey from Northern California to Hawaii, filming dance and hip hop videos to weddings, and now his own cooking show. Philip, thanks for joining me. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I wouldn't say I'm a YouTube star, but. <laughs> I do make YouTube videos. Let's leave it at that. <laughs> hey, look, I, I see the future. And if you're not a star now, you're already, a, you're, you're going to quickly become a star. Because <laughs> I've you. seen your, your, your subscribers grow by like exponential uh, these last few weeks. So, you know, I want to talk all about that and how you got to that point. But, you know, I also want to just find out about your story and, you know, where you grew up, um, you know, what, what your background is and, um, just a little bit more about you. So, so tell me where you grew up and about your childhood and, and some of the passions and, and hobbies you had as a kid. So yeah, I, I am originally from the Bay Area in California. Um, I was born in Fairfield. Um, my father was in the military. So I want to say like I lived my elementary school days there. I went to, you know, like, you know, kindergarten and uh, elementary school. And then we actually got stationed to uh, Hickam Air Force Base back in 1996. So. I lived in Hawaii for a little bit and we lived here from 96 to 2000. So these were like the wonder years, you know, um, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth grade. Um, you know, you start growing up and you're, you're going outside of the house without your parents. And I had my first girlfriend and, you know, uh, definitely the wonder years of my life. And some of the best years of my life uh, were, in, were here in Hawaii, uh, some of the most memorable for sure. And then um, when my father retired, we moved back to California because we bought a house there uh, just before we got stationed here. So we moved back, I finished up um, high school and I did a little bit of college there. And during that time, you know, growing up, I was, I don't wanna say I was like very creative, but I was always interested in like taking things apart and putting them back together. When we moved to Hawaii, my dad actually upgraded his camera. We used to have an old school VHS camera. And he was like, hey, we're, we, we're starting this new life here in Hawaii. I wanna document all this stuff. So he bought a new camera and he gave me his old camera. And I think that's where my filming journey began. And I didn't really know it. I just would you know, bring that camera around and, and film, I don't know, just random stuff that I would you know, go through as a middle schooler. You were that and guy showing up with the camera everywhere. Yeah, yeah. And um, ar around that time, I also really got into rollerblading. And that was, you know, the early 90s where things were starting to blow up the X Games and Brink and, you know, all that stuff. And I would use my camera to film a lot of rollerblading. And I would edit those videos on literally like two VCRs. I would set them up and I would play the video on one. And then I would you know, linear, linear edit them by hitting record on the other one for each clip that I wanted. And I would make these uh, skating videos. And, you know, when we moved back to California, I didn't know anyone that skated. So I kind of just quit it for a little bit. And, and I just went through life, you know, like uh, finishing up high school and started college. And at that time I was working in retail. I was actually working at the mall selling phones. And I remember I'd go to Best Buy all the time and just look at their electronics. And I, I don't know what it was, but one day I was just like, you know, I, don't want, I want to buy a camera. I remember filming stuff. It was fun. I'm just going to buy a camera. And I, and I picked one up and that's when the journey started over again. And I really got into, I, I brought that camera everywhere. 
And it started off with, you know, just bringing it to a bunch of house parties, you know, like college house parties and filming all the crazy stuff that happened there, uh, like fights and just <laughs> the, the word. I'm, I'm trying to copy this footage over on, I have all the tapes still. I want to copy the footage over and I'm, I'm scared to see what's on the Yeah, videos. no one thought at the time when you were filming it that it would ever surface on the internet probably. <laughs> yeah, not only that, but I really don't know what's on there. There's probably some crazy stuff and that's, the main reason I haven't just given these tapes to a, a place that'll copy them for you because I don't know like what's on these tapes. So <laughs> yeah. they'd been sitting in my closet for a while and I, I'm just like, oh, I'll get around to copying them over. Yeah. But anyways, um, <laughs> I um, in high school, all of my friends are really creative. You know, um, we were always in the hip hop scene. So a lot of like DJing and break dancing and rapping. And that was kind of like my group of friends, we were all into, you know, definitely hip hop, anything hip hop, we 100% support it. And um, my friends would, you know, throw these jams and um, they threw these club events. And that's how I started moving from house parties. They're like, hey, I saw your house party video. Do you think you could film my club event or my b-boy jam and make a video to put on MySpace, you know? <laughs> so. <laughs> We, I started, I was like, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll do that. And, you know, they didn't have any budgets, but, you know, it was just like, mm -hmm. it was cool to kind of be the man, right? Like at that time, there was no camera phones. So people weren't filming everything. It was like, hey, we need a cameraman to come in yeah. and shoot these events and Essential. edit these. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and it was cool because when you have these big events, I'm talking, these are like, some of these are international events that were happening people from all around the world were coming to you know breakdance battle and i was able to be on stage in front and film all this stuff like backstage access passes to like all this stuff to film it um and it was cool and and it was definitely great and at the time i got back into rollerblading they built a new skate park in our town and um, i upgraded my camera gear at that time you know I was shooting on like a canon gl2 a lot more professional looking quality productions were coming out and i remember one day i was at the skate park and just all these rollerbladers just showed up out of nowhere and to make a long story short some of these guys were professional and they saw the camera that i had and they were like hey do you want to come film with us and i actually thought they meant rollerblading videos they, they were like professional rollerbladers and they made rollerblading videos uh, one of them one of their names is uh, specifically one of them is Vinny Minton he owns Imperial Video Productions now he he's the one who got me into weddings he put me on he saw my, my I added him on MySpace he saw my cotillion video on my MySpace page or wall and he was like hey or do you want to come shoot weddings with us and I, I thought he meant like I said rollerblading videos but he was like no we don't make any there's no money in the rollerblading industry and we make all of our money by filming weddings <laughs> so he put me on we shot a few weddings together in the bay area and he uh I think Antioch and you know uh northern California and he I remember he was like you know we can't really afford much so we can only budget like 25 dollars an hour <laughs> and in my mind I was like that's the most money. I would do this for free. I right. was doing it for free, you know? And I was like, what? Like, I can get paid to do this? Right. So you're not getting paid to do rollerblading videos or cotillions or filming, you know, fights at frat parties. So now you have this opportunity to actually get paid to shoot. That must have been much better than not getting paid for all the other fun projects you were doing in a sense, right? So I'm getting paid $25 an hour. This is way more money than I've ever made in my life. You know, working retail, I think I was getting minimum wage at a job that I hated doing. And I was like, man, I, I really want to pursue, you know, more shooting. I didn't realize at the time that you can make money doing something that you love. You know, I, I didn't believe it. And once that sort of clicked, I was like, well, maybe, maybe I can do this, you know? And the real thing that happened, the, the one thing that happened was an accident that got me really into this. One of the companies that I was working for at the time, instead of sending me the timeline, he accidentally sent me their contract. <laughs> and when I saw how much he charged for the wedding videos that he was producing, I was like, dude, I could do this. Like, I, he, I think he, they were charging like $5,000 for wedding videos at that time. And this is a lot of money for back in the day, you know? That's a lot back then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was like, dude, I'd do this for like 500 bucks. You know what I mean? 
So that's when I was like, I'm going to try and shoot my own stuff and I'm going to try and edit my own weddings. I've already done cotillions. This is basically the same thing, but it's just with couples now, you know, and I've learned so much uh, working with Vinny and these other companies about audio and lighting and camera placement and all of that stuff. So I, I pitched, you know, wedding videography to some of my friends that were getting married or that were engaged. And I was like, hey, I'll shoot your wedding for free. Uh, I just want to, you know, make my own demos and that sort of thing. And around that time, I was also traveling back to Hawaii a lot. Um, I was working in a retail job. I, I was making pretty good money. And I was like, hey, on my vacation, I kind of just want to go back to Hawaii and just, you know, reconnect with a lot of my friends and, you know, just get back out there. And um, during that time, I was filming a lot and doing all that stuff too. And something in me was just like, you know what? Like, I want to move back to Hawaii. Like, I was just so sick of living in the Bay Area. You know, a lot of people were like, there was just a lot of not good stuff happening. You know, I wasn't really going anywhere. I was just, you know, drinking, going out, partying. You know, a lot of my friends were like getting shot. And, you know, it was just like, we were all in bad crowds. And uh, not to say that we were in the ghetto or anything, but we were definitely like up to no good. And there was something in me, and it's probably a lot for my dad too, just like a lot of pressure to like, you know, I'm 20 something still living at home. And it was just like, you know, you need to get out of the house. You need to do something. I dropped out of college because it wasn't for me. I just decided one day I'm going to move to Hawaii and I, I was able to transfer jobs here. So that, that was how I was actually able to really get out here. I still had some friends that, um, I was connected with since middle school and I was able to move into their house and uh, they let me couch surf for uh, three months while I, yeah, while I got everything figured out. And then, yeah, that's how I ended up transitioning back into Hawaii. I know for me, that was also a similar story where I was living in Indiana and was in my 20s, didn't really have a lot going on and just felt the need to get out and moved to Hawaii and crashed at a, actually at a hostel for a month and then um, kind of just floated around a little bit while I figured out what I wanted to do. So. In your case, when you got to Hawaii, were you, did you have a plan other than go to school, finish my, finish your degree, or did you think, well, let's go, maybe I'll finish school, but if I don't, maybe this wedding thing might work out. Yeah. So actually before I even moved to Hawaii, I remember specifically one day shooting a wedding with my friend Vinny. We were at a hotel and I was telling him like, Hey, I'm thinking about moving to Hawaii. And I didn't realize it at the time but Hawaii was like freaking wedding capital of the world you know I remember all the times that I was visiting before I decided to move I would always see that wedding couple on the beach you know what I mean um, hundreds of weddings a day and I was just like damn there's a lot of weddings out here and that's when I thought like man who what companies are out there right now that are making wedding films like we are you know what I mean? Like the mainland with all this cool cinematic stuff. So I actually looked up who was out there and this is now still motion is out. Still, you know what I mean? Joe Simon, I think was coming up. Um, J Mag in the Philippines, like they started to get really cinematic and I was like, no one's doing this. And I found you, uh, fish eye was one. I looked at all of you guys at competition, fish eye, Aria studios, studio red, I was like, wow, these are the three heavy hitters out there that are doing it, like actually making wedding films, not docu not like, you know what I mean? Uncle There's Bob. The cheesy wedding videos or whatever. Exactly. And I was like, wow, there isn't really any competition out there. It's probably going to be easy for me to move there and start my wedding stuff. Mm -hmm. So when I moved to Hawaii, that was the goal was like, I'm going to try and pick up weddings. What's funny is I moved, I lived in an apartment directly across the street from Central Union Church. So there, I was seeing weddings happening every day. I'm every day. Yeah. Every, like on the hour, you know, I'm seeing these weddings happening across the street and I was like, man, you know, I can do this. He's, uh, I, I should be filming these weddings. How can I get into this? You know? And I remember towards the end of that first year living there, uh, one of these big moments that happened was uh, it was actually on New Year's Day. I was living in Hawaii for only two months and I ended up getting in a fight uh, and uh, the person broke my jaw. <laughs> oh, wow. And um, just, my, but let's, let's, how did he end up? Was he in the hospital too or? Gosh, I don't remember. It was a crazy night. Uh, a lot of people jumped in. There's a baseball bat involved. Oh, wow. But um, 
I ended up breaking my jaw. My mouth got wired shut for six or eight weeks. And um, during that time, I couldn't work. So I took all of that time off to just research Cinema 5D. The website just came out. 7Ds were the new camera. And I was just researching and all this stuff. I created a business plan. I was able to get a loan and buy my first DSLR. I created a website. I learned how to do all of this stuff while I was stuck at home. Kind of like the pandemic that's happening right now. I had this really major moment in my life that stopped everything for me and I couldn't do anything. And I pivoted and I, and I figured out what to do and what's gonna be my next step, you know? And I um, got, all my, got all my gear and I had all my audio gear and I posted a few of my videos on, on my website and everything. And I got discovered by Julian from 10th Letter Media. He was in the process of trying to transition out of shooting Japanese weddings into doing his own thing. And he was looking for a second shooter. So I ended up getting picked up as a second shooter working for Julian and he was busy. He was doing like eight weddings a month, you know, and I was bringing in like three to $500 a wedding. And this was the most money I've ever seen in my life. And in that one, in my first year of moving into Hawaii, I was actually able to quit my job at, at uh, I was selling phones in retail and go full-time wedding videographer. I was able to, you know, tr uh, transition into a full-time uh, cinematographer, uh, second shooting weddings for um, Tenth Letter Media and Julian. And while that was happening, I was also trying to develop my own brand and my own style. And then I started booking my own weddings and then it just sort of quickly snowballed. And, you know, I met you and uh, a lot of the other people out there and, and grew so much just with the scene that we had here the in you know our film industry and the one thing that's so great about our industry here in Hawaii it's that we are all peers everyone helps each other it's not like competition like I was thinking that was my mindset it was the complete opposite yeah and I learned so much from you know you and other people in the industry and it really helped me get my business to where it is today so that's I think you bring up a, a great point too about how you know you talk about the pandemic that we're in today um, I just did an interview with a wedding planner, Samar Hattar, and you know she, we talked to her a lot about how she's being creative and innovative and what she's doing to keep her business afloat during this. And I really can appreciate the fact that as you were, you know, in a, in a bed, in bed for two months with a broken jaw, really not able to do anything, that you didn't mope, you didn't feel bad for yourself, but you had that drive to say, hey, this is this is what I want to do. You know, this is my passion. Um, and I think that speaks a lot to just your character and who you are, somebody that's a go-getter, somebody that works hard um, and is passionate about, you know, filmmaking essentially and wanted to create a business for yourself. Um, so I want to, I want to just kind of hit fast forward just a little bit on that. So you started your business in, I guess, 2010, 2009, 2010. 2010. Okay. So you've been in business for 10 years this year. Congratulations. Uh, not easy for anybody to do. Um, and I think you've really developed a signature style. Uh, I really have enjoyed watching you know, your work and, and seeing you grow and just being somebody that even I look up to and say, wow, you know, your work, that, that kind of work is amazing. And wow, uh, thank you. I think, you know, a lot of other people share that sentiment too. So 10 years you've been doing it. Um, about what, a year and a half ago or uh, somewhere around there, you decided that you wanted to start a YouTube channel. Can you kind of tell me what led to, to that decision? And, and tell me just a little bit about what the show's about. Okay, so what really led to the YouTube channel decision, it, it, it's been an idea of mine for maybe over four years now. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that I realized as a quote unquote business owner, especially in the wedding industry, is that I am my brand. When someone hires my company to film their wedding they're expecting me mm -hmm. so ultimately i don't own a business i own a job mm -hmm. and i'm really just trading my time for money i just happen to be able to set my own schedule and choose who my clients are and i'm very fortunate to have that but i'm realizing or but i realize that i am still having to work to produce income 
And around that time, about four years ago, I really started getting into traveling and I was going out a lot. We, you know, we were traveling to Japan, we were doing Bali and California and all this stuff. And I was like <clears throat> watching a lot of like travel videos on things to do and, and where to go on YouTube. And all these travel people, I started following them on Instagram and, and they were all saying like, we travel full time. And I'm like, how do you travel full time? Don't you need like a job? And you know, a lot of them are saying, I learned this term called passive income. And basically they were able to create, um, they were able to create systems that brought them income while they were not working anymore. And that's what I really needed to figure out is like, how do I bring in money and not, how, how do I do something once? And then it continues to make money. Mm -hmm. And YouTube was one of those ways, you know, like I can make videos and then it, it, I keep getting paid from them based off the views or, or the other ways that you can make money from YouTube, right? Compared to doing client work or doing uh, works for uh, couples, you know, you only get paid once for that video. Right. Uh, the YouTube videos you can get paid multiple times. And if I can have multiple videos that I'm getting paid multiple times for, then that is how I can slowly pivot. I don't want to say pivot out of weddings completely, but you know, like supplement my income. Right. So. I had all these ideas for YouTube videos and I made it, I just basically did a brain dump. Hey, I'm really interested in cooking. I'm really interested in weddings. I'm really interested in living in Hawaii. I'm, I, I love all these different aspects and, and I just started making videos and putting them online. And the ones that started to hit were my cooking videos. And that's when I decided to kind of just start maybe niching down more towards the cooking side. Um, and yeah, so I've just been making more cooking content, basically, and that seems to be what's doing well. Yeah, and dude, I, I have to ask, where did you learn to cook like that? And I've seen some of your videos where you've had your mom in them, and you've done some of her recipes, and they look so delicious. So did you get the cooking ability from your mom, your dad, or both? Or was this something you've always been good at and, and loved to do? Uh, I definitely got the cooking from my mom. I mean, my dad loves to barbecue and I learned how to barbecue through him, but my mom is always in the kitchen cooking up great meals and I would uh, oftentimes help her make some of these meals. I definitely helped make lumpia. I probably rolled a million lumpia in my life. And um, yeah, I just kind of learned from my mom. And when I moved to Hawaii, I didn't have anyone to cook for me anymore, you know, moving out of my parents' house. So I had to learn how to cook. And I basically just watched a ton of YouTube videos and a ton of food network and I would just try these recipes and try and learn how to do them and you know I have my staple dishes that I make every week and yeah and it just kind of started expanding from there and you know uh, living with my fiance Kristen she's always interested in learning new ways to cooking other types of food that I'm not usually um, eating or we'll go out to eat and it's like hey that's it's so expensive to go out to eat in Hawaii but if we can figure out how to make that recipe at home we can have it for much cheaper so right. yeah it's just it's an evolution of different things but it started with my mom and you know moving to Hawaii definitely made me uh, have to learn how to start cooking well Kristen must absolutely love the fact that you've chosen to do a cooking show on YouTube because I'm sure she gets to indulge in a lot of these <laughs> recipes that you're making uh, you know every week or so I'm, I'm sure she must love that she actually just started like a keto diet a keto diet or whatever keto and like she can't eat anything i'm making now. <laughs> <laughs> and it's weird like i am so self-conscious on camera still like it's it's difficult it's like I have anxiety just thinking about talking to my camera. I have to, I make her laugh. Right now, by the way, dude, I don't, I don't know why I mean, <laughs> but they say to do the one thing you're most afraid of, right? So. Yeah, I kick her out. I'm like, hey, you need to go in the bedroom. You need to close the door and you need to put headphones on and listen to music because I can't <laughs> like film myself and you hear me talking. So yeah, but yeah. Tell me I don't about know. that. What, you know, what, what do you think, uh, you know, as far as how you've been able to obviously overcome that to me, when I see you on camera, I'm like, well, you seem very natural. So was there sort of like a tipping point for you where you're like, oh, you know, I can do this. Or was it just, is it still constantly uncomfortable for you? Or how do you overcome that? I'm getting more comfortable with it. I think you just got to keep doing it. You just got to keep doing it and just got to own it. You know, I think one, the most difficult thing I've ever done was talk to a camera in public. Um, that's, 
that was the most terrifying thing I've ever done. And, and I, that was a complete fail too. I'll send you the footage. I, it, it was terrible. And uh, I thought I nailed it and I, I just looked like an idiot. But um, <laughs> I, uh, I think it just takes practice. And a lot of times people say like, oh, look at the camera and pretend like you're talking to your friend. Mm -hmm. And that's difficult for me to imagine, but it is easier for me to pretend that I'm presenting my channel or my content or you know what I'm about to speak to a group of people like a business presentation right. and once I do that it's it's easier for me so I'm just pretending that I'm talking to a group of people that I'm presenting something to that just makes it easier for me and after editing it so many times I realized too that it's okay to mess up and I can just pick up from where I messed up start over and once you cut it together it's, it just looks like you you nailed it right yeah, and I think, you know, one of the things you're also doing, which is really cool, talking a little bit about how you film a cooking show, is you're actually doing how to film a cooking show. So you're kind of <laughs> going behind the scenes of how you're doing what you're doing. There's a big demand today for how-to videos on YouTube, right? So tell me about that. Are you, do you plan on doing more of how to do cooking videos in addition to your actual recipes that you're making? Yeah, definitely. You know my whole channel is really going to be based on food but i'm not a chef you know what i mean i don't know a lot about food i just know the dishes that i like to make and after a while i felt like i might just start be pulling recipes out of the air just to create content and that's not genuine you know but i am a cinematographer and i know a lot about camera stuff i might i'm not pro i mean i guess i'm I guess I get paid to do you're, it. But you're a professional. <laughs> but I'm not the best, you know what I mean? However- Which is fine, right? You don't have to be the best. Exactly. And how? And with that being said, like, there are people that want to learn how to do stuff. And I know a lot more about camera stuff than I do about cooking. And during this pandemic that's been happening, a lot more people have been cooking. And I've seen so many people posting their food and posting their videos of them cooking. and doing all these uh, things that they didn't realize they were passionate about or were already passionate about. And I just thought like, dude, you can get paid to do this. You know, like, what if I told you, you can make money doing what you're already doing for free. Kind of like how I was filming weddings or shooting skating, you know? Right. And I think what scares them is that they don't think they know how to, or they think that they need the fancy gear and the expensive lighting and all that, but it, you really don't. Mm -hmm. And um, I just want to be able to show people that you can do it too. You just have to do it and it could become potential income. Yeah. And, you know, you bring up a great point, which is, you know, today we have this ability to monetize our YouTube channels and basically become our own brand. And having that control is, is really unheard of. In the past, if you wanted to be a, a star, have a cooking show, you'd have to go to some TV sh TV network and, you know, somehow get your own show. You, you would have to be a chef or you'd have to be, have all these credentials, right? Like, you know, you say you're not a chef, you didn't go to school to, to do this, but at the same time to cook food is really, doesn't require a bachelor's degree and, and to be able to be creative with the internet and with all the recipes that are out there, you know, that we can pull up and then do our own little variations of, or, in your case, just take something that mom did and maybe add a little twist to it or whatever. Um, you know, I think it's it's so exciting to to be able to have that ability. So now that you've been doing it for you know about a, a year or two, you've finally been able to start to monetize it to make some money off of it. And I know just from knowing you and your journey, it's it's been pretty recent where you've really kind of seen that uptick. So just tell me for somebody that might be starting their, their own YouTube channel like myself doing this, um, what are some of the tips that you would give to somebody that's, that's, that's new? How often do you need to put out content? Um, maybe some of the back end stuff that you and I have talked about that, that needs to be done. Is there a couple of tips for somebody getting started that you would give? Yeah, for sure. I think the number one tip I would say is to do something you're passionate about something that you genuinely care about and not to do it for money because it's a journey and it's it's a it's a marathon it's not a sprint 
and you're going to start putting out content and it's not going to make money immediately, maybe for years. Mm -hmm. And if you're not passionate about it and you're just doing it for the money and you don't see that money coming in after a week, a month, a year, you're going to quit, you know? So focus on something that you're passionate about. The next thing would be to create content that helps people. Um, YouTube is a search engine. It's the second largest search engine in the world uh, next to Google and it's owned by Google. So people are typing in search terms in the search bar for YouTube. So it's much easier to get picked up if you're teaching how to do something than it is to say, oh, look at my life or look at how I live in Hawaii with my great you know, vlog. No one cares until they care about who you are, right? So you definitely wanna start delivering value to your viewers first before you start trying to transition into this lifestyle, look at me, look at how cool I am. If, right. if, if you were to ever do that or want to do that anyways. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. You know, if you just get on YouTube to start a channel, just to think, oh, how can I make money off of this? Or um, think that people might care about you when they don't know you, um, you know, that's just not going to happen. I think like you say, do something you're passionate about. Um, for me, the reason I started this whole you know, YouTube show is I like to learn from people. I like to hear people's stories. I want to share those stories with other people because even at my age, I've met so many amazing, incredible people who do incredible things with their life. And, you know, most people don't know about them. You know, I know that my whole network doesn't know about you. And so um, being able for me just to share that with other people, I hope will provide value. Um, now, eventually, if I keep doing this for the next year or two, I would like to make some money off of it. That would be sort of like a nice byproduct of it. So that being said, let's, let's say I've got the passion. Let's say I'm providing the value. But if I do want to monetize it, how do I set myself up for that? What would be a couple of tips just maybe in terms of how often you're delivering content, um, some of the back end stuff, you know, with, with hashtags or whatever. Any tips on that that you've seen that work for you? So one of the biggest tools that I use to help get reach on my channel is a plugin called Keywords Everywhere. And this plugin is something that you can download and it, it goes to your like Chrome search or whatever like that. But what you can actually do is, or the way this tool works is you can type in a phrase into YouTube, um, like meatloaf, <laughs> for example and or meatloaf recipe because if you see meatloaf you'll get the band right but meatloaf recipe and you can see how often this term is searched you know uh chocolate chip cookies that term is searched on youtube almost half a million times a month so when you start trying to think of ideas it's always good to use this tool and think well what are people searching for if you don't want to download the tool and pay the money for it i think it's only like 10 bucks and you get like a hundred thousand keyword searches but if you don't want to pay for it, you can just start typing in words and search and start audio populating stuff, how to, and then the next couple of things will pop up. These are things that people are searching for already. Um, maybe you type in Honolulu, Hawaii, and then you'll see the next words that pop up are like restaurants or whatever. And these will kind of give you some great ideas on the kind of content that people are searching for that you could create within your niche and then get more reach, you know, mm -hmm. and then this, those views will then lead to uh, more subscribers that are enjoying your content. And you really need, uh, I think a thousand subscribers and I think about 4,000 minutes or an hours of, of watch time before you can start getting monetized. Mm -hmm. And then that's when you can start actually making income off of your views. Now, YouTube views, I wanna say is the worst way to make money off YouTube. It's the easiest way because it just happens, but it's the most, risky because you have no control over what youtube's going to change you know what i mean they might change your policies and say you know what now we're not doing ads anymore and and you were really banking off just ads you know or maybe they cut that pricing in half and now your income that you were living off of it just got cut in half you know mm -hmm. so there are other ways to make money from youtube and that would be you know with affiliate marketing um you can create a product like I can make a cookbook and it's a downloadable PDF, you know, um, whatever niche you're in, you know, um, if you were doing weddings, you could tell people how 
you book weddings and uh, your your contract or booking process and then you can sell your contract you know that you, you want to sell a product you know these are the things that you can have control of um you could sell merchandise uh t-shirts now where is that, done through? is that done through like your own youtube channel or is that done through something else you talk about a cookbook do they just click a separate link under your description or how does that work yeah so these are digital products that you would make separately and then you would put a link in your uh, description and then you would do call to actions in your videos hey if you're interested in learning more check out my course on how to cook cooking videos the links in the description you know mm -hmm. uh, those sort of things so these are kind of the best ways to mm -hmm. diversify your income you know what i mean and, and have uh other revenue streams within that and youtube doesn't have to be your main platform maybe you don't like being on camera you know maybe you just like talking you can do a podcast you know maybe you don't like your voice and you don't like to be seen on camera you could do a blog you know blogs are still very popular you know um instagram is another great uh platform where you could share educational valuable information through mm -hmm. photos or videos and then have them linked in the description or your bio on where they can buy these items or you know purchase these items you know so it, it's really on what you're into and, and what you want to do um what you're in what you're passionate about just do something you're passionate about that you believe in that you want to share with the world that's a great point you know you, you don't have to actually when we're talking basically about you know monetizing content is kind of what this is about you know with your youtube channel but what you're saying is that there are other outlets so let's like you say maybe you don't like to be in front of the camera that's okay you can do a podcast or you can write a blog with you know whatever you want to share on there there's also other platforms for creators i know i've heard of and i haven't done a ton of research on this yet but maybe you can help out with platforms like patreon um, rokefin locals.com these are a bunch of other platforms that are alternatives to youtube now so if you are someone that say wants to do a YouTube channel, are you also able to do other platforms like that with your videos and still monetize content there? Does it have to just be, you know, exclusive with YouTube or do you know how that all works? Uh, you know, I'm not too familiar with those other platforms. I do have a Patreon though. Mm -hmm. um, I'll put a link in the bio if you want to support my channel or you will for me, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, I think what is Patreon? Can you tell me about that? Patreon is similar to like a crowdfunding type thing where, you know, even back in the day with like Picasso, um, he was like, uh, he, the way he made money is he had Patreons that would enjoy his work and said, Hey, I want you to paint this. I'll pay you to paint this, you know? And that's sim basically what it is now. You know, you just have fans or, or Patreons that enjoy your work and they want you to be able to create you know so it's just an opportunity or another resource or another i'm sorry it's another income stream that uh, creators can have to continue to create the things that they want to make gotcha. um, one thing i do know is that i own my content on youtube in a sense where i can put it wherever i want so i can put that same content on igtv or wherever else and i can I guess essentially monetize it however I want, you know. Um, it's just the platform that I'm using, YouTube, mm -hmm. uses my content to push ads to viewers and that's how they make their money. Gotcha, okay, so what you're saying is it doesn't have to be exclusive to YouTube or Patreon. And Patreon is something if, you know, somebody sees a bunch of your cooking videos and they say, hey, you know, can you, uh, can you make, you know, um, these chocolate chip cookies that I've been wanting someone to do, can, then they can pay you to actually produce that video. Yeah, so I think with Patreon, there's different tiers that you can set up. So uh, these Patreons, they'll pay this monthly uh, fee or monthly uh, donation towards your channel. And you could set up those tiers however you want. Like, I don't have any tiers. It's just whatever you want to donate. But some people would be like, hey, for $3 a month, thank you for supporting my channel. You get nothing, right? But if you do $5 a month, I'm going to post, uh, you'll have access to my personal vlogs that I'm going to post every month. You know what I mean? And for $10 a month, I'll give you, you know, uh, first dibs on all my content before it goes on YouTube or whatever it may be, right? And then for like $250 a month, you can create a recipe and I'll make it, you know? So it's just really what you want to do and how you want to do it. 
so one of your questions was, you know, how often should we upload? And I think consistency is definitely key, but a lot of people get burnt out on YouTube because they think they need to post a video, you know, twice a week or once a week. I just honestly post videos as often as I can make them. And I don't put any pressure on myself to have to hit a certain number. I definitely did set some goals this year, especially during this pandemic to produce some, as much content. And I think I bit off a little bit more than I can chew, but that's when I realized, hey, maybe I just need to dial back. It's not about the analytics and the numbers. I think it's just back to going to just creating the things that you're passionate about and just sharing it with the world. It's once you get once you get tied up in the analytics and I was I was looking at those numbers every day and, and seeing like, oh, why isn't this? Why did I drop down in views and all that? And, and it's 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 not a place you want to go. It, it, you just focus on the content and when you want to put it out there. Right. Um, if you're doing something passionate, like you said earlier. It's not about you know, having to motivate yourself to get up and do it all the time because you want to do it. It's just, you know, kind of making sure you're putting out quality content and quantity of course will follow. But the main thing is, I know as a professional videographer that you want it to be a high quality. So you're not going to sacrifice probably, you know, quantity for quality. Yeah, it's definitely hard to, it's one of those things where it's like, it's either done or it's going to be perfect and perfect will never happen you know so some of these videos are like i oh, just get it out you know but every video i want to be better than the last and i want to up them just ever so slightly and and just yeah produce i want to do my best work and um and be proud to share it with everyone okay so tell me you know now that we kind of got an idea of, of how the youtube channel works um and it sounds like you've really got a good foundation going that you've really sort of set yourself up to just take off you know I know that you posted recently that you went from, I believe, 5,000 to 10,000 subscribers in, I think it was a week time or something along those lines, a very short amount of time. Is that right? Yeah, I think I had less than 1,000 subscribers in December 2019, and now I'm at 13,000. Wow. Yeah, and it's just, it's just gone exponentially up. So I, I'm sure for you, this must be just very exciting, you know, to see this growth and knowing now that you can continue to do this, you know, during this pandemic, especially, you know, uh, a lot of us, including myself, including yourself, we haven't been able to shoot any events or any types of weddings or anything. Um, so in a sense, the timing of your channel taking off couldn't have really happened at a better time. I gave myself two years. I was like, hey, I'm gonna give YouTube two years. And if it doesn't work, I'm gonna figure out the next, the next move, you know, it, for passive income. And I didn't really think, you know, 2019 is when I started. I made three videos in January, and I posted them back to back to back in three weeks. And then I quit because I, it was a lot of work. YouTube is a lot of work. Creating videos is a lot of work. And um, the wedding season started, and I just kind of gave up. The thing that happened was my channel really started to pick up at the end of the year and then that's when i realized like, hey maybe i should just double down on this you know so i want to say 2020 is really my year where i said i'm going to start and i'm going to give it two years from here because i didn't really try in 2019 but now i am and i'm seeing the traction when i'm starting to be consistent where do you see this channel a year or five years from now the way I see this channel going maybe a year or even five years from now is I definitely want to transition more into stuff that helps people. Uh, I mean, cooking videos are definitely great. People are searching for them, but I definitely want to start pivoting more and helping people create uh, their own cooking videos and how they can do that better. Mm -hmm. I want to create a course that people can download and learn how to shoot and edit on their phone because those are the tools that most people have and that's all you really need to make really good videos. You know, the way technology is and the way the world is moving and the way everything's happening, this is the future. Mm -hmm. Everyone is your own brand, whether you realize it or not. And you can capitalize on that if you can just learn how to do it, you know? And um, it's funny, we always push our children to go to school and get a good job, you know, go to college, get a good job and have that secure job and to work till you're 
65 and then retire and then live the what the next 10 years of your life and how secure are those jobs now right and all the ones that are really flourishing are the ones that people created themselves or their own brands you know so um it's definitely you know the future of the way things are going to go and um i want to be able to help people maneuver through that transition and figure out ways that they can become their own brand the other thing i want to do is transition my videos and figure out ways that i can help hawaii you know i feel very fortunate to call hawaii my home and i i think you know uh the feeling too that hawaii is definitely a special place and it doesn't get the recognition that it deserves and there's a lot of businesses and a lot of restaurants and a lot of like local farms and all these things that i really want to kind of highlight in all of my cooking now i get my my produce locally sourced you know i get um you know my meat locally sourced you know these are the the things that this is the way it should be mm. and i really want to kind of like highlight those things too without getting political but you know trying to help these other uh places or these other businesses um get some exposure that they deserve and you know to try and help other businesses as well yeah i love the title of your show which is called what's good and i think that gives you so much latitude to really you know not just be in the kitchen like you have been but also like you say maybe getting out and and interviewing other business owners or highlighting those businesses um i know one of them that you and i both love is butcher and bird um and you've definitely pumped them up a few times on your on your social media platforms and things like that um so i can i can definitely see how you'll be able to use your channel as a tool for helping out hawaii the ohana there in hawaii um with you know with your outreach that you have on your station so yeah i can totally see that you know with with your channel and i think also you know something else you were just saying which is very important is that in something i've learned and a lot of people have been learning is it's it's not necessarily smart to put all your eggs in one basket especially when you can't control you know the outcome for example in this pandemic like we were talking about those that shoot weddings if that's all that they're doing then you know there's really nothing else out there for them to do right now but having a passive income like you're talking about being your own band, being your own brand having your own control over it um it really is it's really the wave of the future. It's I mean it's already been here for several years now, but I think most of us are realizing now that you know, it's really smart to to try to at least capitalize on this you know opportunity that YouTube gives creators to be able to to be their own brand and to monetize their own channel. Um so I think it's really awesome that you've done that and also that you're looking to give back to Hawaii and I just kind of see the options Uh, limitless for you uh, in the directions that you want to go with it. Yeah, I think uh, uh, the other thing too is I wanted to diversify my YouTube channels, you know. I don't want to just have a cooking YouTube channel. I'm thinking about making a a wedding related channel that's going to help educate brides and connect them with vendors, you know, mm-hmm. um to help my wedding industry because the wedding in- I I owe everything I have to the wedding industry here in Hawaii. I wouldn't be where I am uh today if it wasn't for this industry. So if there's any way that I can, you know, give back to the industry as well. Um that's another thing that I definitely want to try and do with a with a whole another channel and, you know, maybe create like a Hawaii related channel where we will focus in on local businesses and and those sort of things too. So I have some other channels ideas in the works. It's just a it's just like when are we going to open back up to get started, you know? So Yeah. It's just the it's just the process and it's just you just got to be patient I guess. So you don't even have to do just one channel for everybody listening. You can have 2, 3, 4 channels. There's no limit. And again, you know, Philip is following his passion. He's providing value, which I think is you know, after, with this conversation that we've had, I think that's the two things that have stuck out to me and something that you've you know, I've actually talked about before, which is just provide value in in do something that you're not necessarily going to get anything from but by giving your sort of you know um that's that's what you receive is the gift of knowing you're helping people and eventually it will kind of work itself out as far as monetization but um again i just think those two things are so key you know doing something you're passionate about and doing something that's going to provide value yeah i think there was this 
graph that you can probably find online where it says like, what's your life purpose, right? It's something that you're passionate about. It's like a, it's like a three, it's a circle grids, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's like one circle bleeds into the other one. Mm. And then it's like something you're passionate about, something that helps other people, something that like helps the world and then something that can create income, right? Mm. And then this is like a job, right? And then this is like a whatever, whatever, but it all comes in together with, you know, your life purpose. And if you can just figure out what you're passionate about and how you can use that to help other people and change the world, which sounds crazy, but it's not. You just have to believe it, but you know, change the world. It, income will be one of those byproducts and then that's going to be your life purpose, you know? So that's one of the things that the, the real cornerstone of that is something that you're passionate about. Mm -hmm. So I got to know you've, you've done a lot of different recipes so far on your show. Do you have one specifically that was the most challenging to do? Man, yesterday I did a French fry recipe, probably one of the most basic recipes I've ever done. And it's just such a process to do it. I think you don't have I, the big uh, five guys thing where you can just. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and not only that, but I think what makes these videos so challenging for me is that I'm filming them by myself. So I'm trying to like make sure my camera's in focus and I'm trying to change the angles to keep it dynamic while at the same time, like not burning my food and, you know, moving around the kitchen and moving my lighting quickly over. And it, it's just a mess. It's, it's actually. It's sometimes frustrating to where it's like, why am I even doing this? You know, I just need to figure out a better system. But I think the French fry one was frustrating yesterday because I overboiled the potatoes and they fell apart. Um, and but it was a lesson learned because I, I learned that, hey, I shouldn't buy just enough ingredients for the dish. I should consider the fact that I might need to do multiple. Maybe I'll burn this one. <laughs> Maybe I'll mess up on this chicken. Yeah, Maybe if you I'll burn the one chicken and you don't have any more chicken, then you got to go back to the store and get more chicken. <laughs> yeah, so I'm learning as I'm going and I'm learning that like, hey, maybe I should just buy a, a cooktop that I can put on my prep table so that way I don't have to move all my lights over to the stove and move my cameras, you know? So just these little things that I'm learning as I go. But um, I would say that it was one of the easiest, but it ended up becoming the most difficult uh, dishes was actually yesterday. And I'm editing it right now, so. Yeah, that's funny. Sometimes that's what causes the most frustration. It sounds like, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of your recipes and a lot of them look really complex. To me, French fries would seem to be less complex. So I think sometimes that unmet expectation that can cause that frustration you have to overcome. Yeah, definitely. I think I'm trying to keep my recipes as simple as possible now, especially understanding that these are things that people are searching for. And I just want to stick to the basics so that way I can at least hit hit the searches, you know? Mm -hmm. And then it's just some simple stuff that we just enjoy eating. And it's not these really in-depth, complex recipes that people need to pull well, off. I, I do have one recipe request, if I can throw that out. I'm sure you get uh, people every day saying, oh, can you cook this? Can you yeah, cook yeah. that? That must be fun to hear all the time. So I'll just add to it. I've been working on a Nashville hot chicken recipe I've been kind of experimenting I love Nashville hot chicken it's amazing there's a place out here in LA called Hal and Ray's which is the world's best fried chicken um, so I'm just gonna throw that out there you can put it on the list of all the suggestions that people have have done and I would love to see you do that someday yeah Matt so I have a fried chicken recipe in the works and I think if I can master that the next one would be mastering that hot sauce because it's like an oil. It's not really like a sauce, you know what I mean? It's like the way it coats the chicken and there's all this all this stuff that goes into it. You want it spicy, but you want flavor. Oh man, that's a good one. Yeah, I'll definitely yeah. look into that. Yeah, no, I've, I've failed a couple times and then I've had one successful run with it. So, you know, I'm still experimenting and, and trying to, you know, not get frustrated yeah. <laughs> and be able to cook, Yeah. You know, so. Um, that's the fun part though about cooking, you know, you, you can experiment. Recipes are really more of like a guide. It's not really like, it's gotta be black and white, you know, if I don't like shallots, I'm not gonna put that in there, you know what I mean? Or if I don't like this pickles, I hate pickles. I'm not gonna put it on my burger, you know, so. It's but just what like, you probably do, right? You find recipes and then you modify them a little bit to uh, kind of be the way you, that, you know, has your signature to it. A hundred percent. All these recipes that I have, I didn't create them, you know what I mean? They're just some of the recipes that I copied and then I just kind of put my own twist to it or, or I did what I like or I cooked it 
differently because you can get more flavor if you, you know, sear the chicken before you, instead of boiling it, you know? So there's just these little things that I do to make it my own. And we'll be seeing more of your cats, Neko and Chi Chow in <laughs> some of the upcoming videos. I love seeing them and I just wonder if maybe we can have more of them. I get so much shit for having, can I say that? <laughs> say whatever I get, you want. Yeah, I get so much shit for having my cats in the videos and it's like, some people just probably just don't own pets, you know what I mean? And <laughs> it is what it is, but I... You just have something against cats, maybe, you know? Yeah, yeah, but <laughs> it's funny because I'll get comments like, like it's a commercial kitchen or something. It's like, dude, this is just my house. I'm just cooking like for me and I'm just sharing the video with you. It's not like I'm in a restaurant. They're like, I can't believe you use his hands to touch the chicken. And it's like, oh. anyways, um, it's just, it comes with the territory, I guess. But yeah, uh, yeah I think if, if they want to be in it, I never set them up. It's just like they're in, the, they're in the kitchen. If I'm in the kitchen, my cats are so fat. If I'm in the kitchen, they think they're going to get fed. So they're just like walking around the whole time. So <laughs> yeah, that's, um, you brought, actually brought up an interesting Point there which is one of the sort of reasons I was apprehensive about ever starting this is just the trolls right so now that you have 13,000 subscribers that means you get more people watching and more comments so how do you deal with just looking through the comments and you know not not taking it personal oh I take them all personal it hurts my feelings so much like I try not to let it hurt me and it's like do you know how much time I spent just setting up my camera gear, filming this, mm -hmm. frustration, editing, how much went into making this video and then to get like some person to just like shut it down. It's just like, it's, it hurts, man. It hurts so much. I, I, I just start deleting them now. I don't even like, not that I delete them from the, I don't go through, it's not like I go through and look at my comments. Um, because not to sound all like whatever, but I get so many comments that they're just like my, I had to turn off my notifications because it's just like, it, you just, they just happen. So every now and then though, it'll, I'll open up my YouTube to check the analytics and then the top comment is like a troll or the know-it-all, right? You have the know-it-all that's like, actually, blah, blah, blah. Get the recipe wrong or yeah. Yeah, 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 whatever, right? So anyways, um, I just hide the comment. So that way it just, I don't see it. Mm -hmm. And then I always got a lot of those, uh, we get a lot more positive comments than we do negative, you know? So I uh, just try and focus on the positive. But yeah, to say that the comments don't hurt would be a lie. Like they, it's they hurt, the man. Beginning, I think, right? When you're not used to it, you're not used to having that, that negativity in your life. And, you know, yeah. it's just there. I think I would, you know, I would guess that over time, as you do this longer and longer, it'll probably bounce off you more, but I can see yeah. how it would still, you know, you're you're a very you know nice guy, and uh, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't say you're sensitive, but you know that I think oh, I'm so sensitive. <laughs> if you were a lead jerk and you were just sort of you know whatever, I think it would probably you would care less. But yeah, what know. I started doing was I started screen capturing them and sharing them because <laughs> I I that was like almost my way of like putting it out there to be like, look at this guy, you know what I mean? And then just to see other people like laugh at them and 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 kind of like back me up. It yeah. makes me, it, that kind of helps me feel a little bit better. And even though like I'm giving them more attention than they, they deserve, it's almost kind of like fun to like do that. So yeah. every now and then if there's a good one, so because there's some good ones on there. I'm so honored that you would come on the show and, and do this with me. And uh, no uh, thank you so much, man. And I can't wait to see where your YouTube channel goes from here. And you know, uh, if people can find you, what's the best way to find you? Uh, the best way to find me is it's on Instagram. I guess that's where I post all my stuff. It's just my name, Philip with one L underscore and then Lemoyne, L-E-M-O-I-N-E. -E. Uh, you can also check out some of my uh, non-wedding work and some of my more of my passion projects on my website, philiplemoyne.com. And then of course my YouTube channel right now, which is um, youtube.com slash Philip Lemoyne. Uh, and yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for having me, man. It was definitely an honor uh, to be able to sit down with you and, and talk about these types of things. I, I definitely feel honored to be a part of your uh, your show. Thank you. Well, thank you, man. And, and like I said, it's just been awesome to see you. You know, I remember the first time I met you at the wedding cafe and uh, to just have seen you grow over these last 10 years and, you know, just be somebody that I think everyone that knows you, we all admire you because of 
the kind of person that you are uh, to everybody. Uh, you're a giving person. Um, you're very kind. And I just couldn't be more happier for someone to see the success that you've seen uh, with your YouTube channel. So uh, thanks again for coming on. Yeah, thank you so much. That means a lot. I appreciate it. Oh, oh. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm.